Hello, everyone. So I'm going to start out with just asking a question here. And I want you all to be honest. This is not a trick question. Let me ask you a few questions here. It's no, no trick questions, just, just a moment of, you know, first thing that comes to your head. Raise your hand if you have experienced frustration in the past seven days. <laughs> OK. All right. OK. Uh, raise your hand if you've held a pen in the past seven days. All right. Raise your hand if you've experienced democracy in the past seven days. OK. All right. Yes. Now, now um, let's say this was last week. Uh, so what's today? Today, well, yes, Friday. So Friday the 7th. So let, let's say this was Friday, November 1st. And this, we're now Friday, November 1st. How many of you experienced democracy in the past seven days? All right. How many of you have experienced democracy in the past 30 days? All right. How many of you experienced democracy in the past six months? In the past year? OK, so now we've got maybe about 60% of you. And we had a pretty good number in the, in the first, maybe about 20% of you. I usually ask this question, and two people will, maybe one, two people will raise their hands. Now, what was that? <laughs> yes, this is Ithaca. <laughs> now, uh, some of you, some of you uh, may have been wondering, what does he mean by democracy? Anybody wonder that? Yeah, a number of, many of you were, un were wondering that. So, you know, that, that's really what we're going to be talking about today is most people have not had a chance, have not, will not say that they've experienced democracy, you know, within a certain amount of time. And a response, a question, just what do you mean by democracy, begs another statement. If I have to, if you have to ask, what does someone mean by democracy, then it's not present. It's not present for you. No one, no one here asked, or I, I dare to say no one here thought, what does he mean by frustration? What does he mean by a pen? <laughs> some kind of writing implement? What, what is that? No, we're, we're very clear about what some of these things are when we experience them, when we experience them every day. The things that we don't really experience then the questions come up. But we live in a country that is, we, we say we're a democracy. We, uh, you know, as a, we, have, we elect governments that bomb other countries in the name of democracy. So there must be something that we know about. But if we don't experience it, then how can we actually say that we know it? Or that we're an authority on it in the world or even in our own communities? So you know, it's just something to let that, let that sit with you for a moment. What that results in for, for many of us is, is a, an inherent problem. Because if we are not familiar, if we don't really experience democracy, we don't really experience this idea of just having a say. And when you don't have a say in something, and you have communities, an entire, an entire country, where people don't have a say, then you have a whole slew of problems that result. And you have a problem, essentially, in accountability. We have an economy that has an accountability problem. We have governments that have accountability problems. We hear all the time people complaining about uh, people who aren't listening to them, government agencies that aren't listening to them, elected officials that aren't listening to them, companies that aren't listening to them. But th what there is is really a problem in accountability. What's that a sign of? You know, and a problem in accountability results in problems that show up down the road that we don't necessarily think of as accountability problems, or we don't think of as problems in democracy, or something that's really a structural problem in how we make decisions, in how companies are set up. We don't think of the economic sphere as something that really has an impact, or, or something that is really a place where democracy has a place. You know, we, it's not a space where where people are, think of, uh, you know, I can make decisions there. Democracy is supposed to exist in the business place. Most of us, you know, people go to work and we leave democracy at the door. And since we spend most of our, many people, we spend most of our times at work of democracy ever really playing out. This is an image, uh, this is a bit pixelated, but it's an image, it's an image of, uh, in what's known as Cancer Alley, 
down in the, Louis in the Louisiana area where you have communities, primarily African-American, that are living right next, to, uh, right next to refineries, right next to oil, oil petroleum plants. And this, it's right there, it's right, people are right next to it. None of these companies uh, have, have decision-makers that live within the communities that they're impacting. And so what that is is an accountability problem. You know, if you have people who are making decisions, who aren't experiencing the impact of their decisions, there's no feedback mechanism for them. They're not actually getting that, that impact that says, okay, you know, we're doing something that is inherently bad. It's, it's really causing, it's causing pain, it's causing a crisis for the people that are surrounding our community because we don't actually live there. We don't want to get to experience it. If the, I'm sure if the smokestacks in that community were actually pointed into the boardroom, you'd have very different kinds, uh, you'd have a very different petroleum industry <laughs> in the United States. And we, we wouldn't be talking about it so much. This is an image uh, from, this was about, about two years ago, there was a fire in a garment factory in Bangladesh. And this is a garment factory that supplied all of, you know, many of the names that people are familiar with at Walmart and, and you know, private labels that, that are, can be found at Walmart, but they also print, uh, pr produce labels for Disney, for Sears, for Sean John, uh, you name it, Tommy Hilfiger, a number, of different, a number of different companies. So these are sweatshops, and they operate in the same way that you have the petroleum industry that's impacting the surrounding communities. You have an industry that is impacting its workers and the people who are actually there experiencing it each and every day who don't have a say in what happens in the company and are treated as dispensable. You know, they can be let go at any moment. Their health does not matter. Now, I want to take a moment. You, we know the negatives, and you hear about it. You hear about it on TV. Uh, you, you know it. You, you may have experienced it at some point in different capacities in your life. And at some point, this is Ithaca, so you, you'll, you'll run into somebody who's organizing some kind of campaign around one of these issues, around sweatshops, or around, uh, around environmental justice, whatever it is, you know, you'll run into someone. So imagine, it's, I'm actually gonna ask all of you for your, your trust and confidence. I want all of you to close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes. Great, you're a beautiful, trusting crowd. So close your eyes and imagine, what would it look like for me if I go to work and at work, I actually get to have a say in the place that I work at. What would it look like for me as I make my way, if I'm, I got an injury, I had to go to the hospital. I actually have a say at the hospital. What would it look like if I walk into city government I walk into the city hall, or I walk into the, into the state assembly, and I actually have a say. What are the things that are actually happening? What's the communication between me and the other people around me? What are the, what's the infrastructure that exists there? What's the space where I can actually speak? Who's actually listening to me? What if, now imagine, let's say uh, you're going into your house of worship now. Say it's Sunday, you're at a church, or you're at a mosque, or at your, you're at temple. What would it look like within your religion to have a say? And what would it look like, say you're, if you're a university student, or you're a high school student, or you're a middle school student, what would it look like to have a say at school? Okay, you can open your eyes now. So now you've got that, a bit of that brewing in your mind. I'd say what that looks like is closing a gap on an accountability problem and creating structures, creating spaces where you actually get to have a say in what's happening around you. And when you do that, then you're actually able to create a different kind of economy, a different kind of government, you know, a different kind of experience with different, completely different social action, interactions ones that we're not really trained in to experience, ones that we're not accustomed to knowing, ones that require us to have a, develop a whole new different set of how to communicate and listen to each other, to actually listen, to, pro, to solve problems, to come to consensus, to make decisions. 
We actually all experience democracy in different ways. You know, we all get together at some point with other people and make decisions. We make decisions as groups. And we make decisions with, you know, it could be one person, it could be 12 people, you know, it could be 20, whatever it is. But we actually do, we are in the habit of making decisions. But it's not one that we're, it, it's present for us in the larger society. We, when we go to work, it's expected that we're under a benign dictator at best. You know, we've got, we're working for people who have good, good ideas, good visions at best, you know, and they listen to each other. They listen to people. You know, and when we go, we go to school, we're, our best hope is that we go to, we, we're in a class where we've got a professor who's actually worth listening to. You know, and maybe there's some time for some discussion and we get to actually, at some point, do what we're actually interested in. You know, those are some glimpses, some glimmers. But for the most part, it's not, it's not expected to be that way. So our places for democracy wind up being a few private spaces. You know, if, we are, if we're part of a few that are engaged in community organizing, then we're engaged in actually taking on that leadership, taking on that capacity to make decisions. So earlier there was, there was talk about one of those fundamental pieces uh, for, for really having a different kind of society is, is development of leadership and have, having leadership. But before you can have leadership, you've got to have a say. You've got to think that you can, you can have a say. And that's actually part of the whole part of a process of leadership. But it's really about having a say and creating the spaces where people can have a say. So there are places where we can have a say. And when we think about what is a way to move forward, or what can, what can our economy look like? And what can our society look like? Look like? I, I say here that that future, part of that future, is in the world of cooperatives. And it's about cooperative and cooperation and people actually working together, putting, putting their resources together, but doing things together. And that's a direction that as a society, more and more, more and more people are moving towards just from, from the realm of technology. When if we look at things just as, as what's now old as Wikipedia, to, uh, you know, to just the, the whole idea of cooperatives and worker cooperatives, which has been around for a very long time, but it's something that has been, become of growing interest, growing interest and desire. So this is something that, that has really grown. There, we're in Ithaca, and there are a number of, of cooperatives. I believe there are five, five different kinds, five cooperatives that are operating in Ithaca. But around the country, there, you know, the cooperative economy is, is growing. And it's one that has really grown significant interest, particularly in the past, uh, the past four to eight years, as when the economy, since the economy has taken a nosedive. But it's one that is really based around people coming together and sharing and building resources. What you are, what you're looking at here, is a breakdown of some of the different kinds of cooperatives. And I, I put this up here just as for many, most people aren't familiar with cooperatives. Well, actually, I'll, I'll ask here. Raise your hand if you're familiar with cooperatives. Beautiful, because this is Ithaca. If we could turn the cameras around, you know, people, people would see, you'd see, a, you know, a, look like most of you actually raised your hand. So in the, co in the cooperative space, it's fair to say there are three different kinds of cooperatives. And these are, these are businesses, these are real businesses, owned and controlled by their members for the sake of providing services and meeting the needs of their members. And it's something that it is a business, as I said, owned and controlled by their members to meet the needs of the members. And so with ownership, there are two rights that you have as an owner of any business. You've got a right to make decisions about the business, and you've got a right to any profits or surplus generated by that business. So when we talk about cooperatives, we can break them up into who those members are. So you've got a business that's owned and controlled by its members, you can think of them differently based on who the members are. So you've got a cooperative that is owned by the people who shop there, the consumers. Uh, in Ithaca, I think, uh, what is it, Green Star? So you've got Green Star Cooperative is a consumer cooperative. In New York City, the, we have the largest, uh, they're the, the largest consumer cooperative in the country. They're called Park Slope Food Cooperative. They've got, I think, now about 17 or 18,000 members members that, that shop there and that work there. So these are people who come together because there was a, a market failure. There was a demand that they had for a service that wasn't being met. So they got together and they pooled their resources and said, we can provide this where other people haven't. 
we have a demand and we have a need in the same way that, uh, that Dennis Derrick spoke to, uh, there was a failure, uh, there, it wasn't, people weren't asking the consumers what do they actually want. In this case, people, we have a demand or for a need for a service that wasn't being met. And so consumers are getting together and saying, we can actually provide it for ourselves. So you've got a cooperative of people who are coming together as consumers. Now, beyond that, you've got cooperatives of people who are coming together as producers or suppliers. These are independent businesses who say, who, who's, who are operating in business and they're, for whatever reason, they're struggling. They're struggling because they, re they recognize at some point that they're operating, they're operating on their own. And there's a whole climate out there that they feel like they're battling, they're battling, you know, hordes, and they're going up a hill, and they're going at it alone. So how can they actually survive? So if you're a small hardware store, how do you survive in the space of a Home Depot? You know, if you're if you're a farmer, how do you survive? And you grow cranberries, how do you survive in the space of a Del Monte? So these farmers or these hardware store owners, they get together and they say, you know what, we can, we can pool our resources together and we can market ourselves as one entity and we can save money when we're buying in bulk or when we buy, we buy, whole, we buy on, a, on a larger scale. So that's how you get these shared services or producer or marketing cooperatives. And that's how you get the ocean sprays of the world and you know, the sun kisses of the world, the ace hardware stores. So these are cooperatives of businesses that are coming together. My favorite kind of cooperative, and this is a, this is a space where I've been in for, for the past 11 years now, is really growing, helping to grow a third kind of cooperative, which is a cooperative of workers. People who are coming together, coming together <coughs> as the people who are actually working day in and day out in a company. And they say, you know, we can run a business better than our bosses or our boss or the owner of the company has been running it. So, you know, let's do it ourselves. Or they may be in a, they've been in a plant that, had, that was on the threat of shutting down, as is the case for the, the worker owners at New Era Windows in Chicago, who, who uh, just who formed about two years ago and about three years before that gained news nationally as workers who locked, who locked down a window, window plant in Chicago, which is Republic Windows. They shut the plant down for about two weeks, and the idea came out, well, you know, why are, why are we just shutting this down and asking for you know, a few dollars more in our contract and asking to make sure that, our, that we're, we're working and we get a job here? How about we just take over the company and own it? So out of that, that initial struggle, was birth new era windows. So they, they've taken that on and they actually run the plant as, as worker owners of the company, of a window factory. So these are people who are coming together as owners of a business. And they say that they, you know, they're coming together because they see that there's an opportunity for them to run the business themselves and to be able to be that, that agent of change in their own community. One of the, uh, I, I make it my point, I go around uh, in, throughout New York City and I look for people who have ideas who want to start up businesses and want to do it together as a cooperative. At Green Worker Cooperatives, we particularly focus on worker-owned businesses as worker cooperatives. And so we look for people who want to be in that space where they've got an idea, they, they know that they can get a business off the ground, and they, but they want to do it as a group. They want to do it as a, as a team for a number of different reasons but they see in them in themselves an opportunity to create a business that's good for that's good for them as the workers as owners of a business that allows them to actually have a business uh, working together with other people that speaks to their values but they want to create a business that is actually able to empower the workers you know to ha actually ensure that people everyone who's working in the company has a say in the business and feels that they're not just showing up for a check for a paycheck but they're actually showing up because they experience something at their workplace where they don't get any place else in society. That democratic decision making, actually getting to have a say, feeling that there's not, not feeling it, but actually knowing from your own, from the direct experience that you are actually at a place where you get to shape what happens. And with that comes something very special that all of us hold dear, which is dignity. You know, just actually being able to, 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 
say that you are, you are working in a place and feeling dignified, that this is something you have pride in. You take pride and you show it. That's a, that's a major thing. And then there are, other, there are, of course, other benefits because there are the benefits of owning. When you own something and you, you build up assets, you, you actually, it is your asset. The business is your asset. And with that certainly comes the thing that most people, many people, when they're, when they're starting up a business, they're looking for, which is profit, though it's not the, it's not the main motivator. Most people who are starting up a business, their, their vision is to change the world. You want to leave your mark on the world and say, you know, when I die and when I'm gone, that the world is different because I was in it. And what and what and how I did it was through my business. But you're actually able to create something that lives beyond you. But you're also able to get a benefit, a financial benefit. And seeing that and actually experiencing that, growing from it, is something that that you don't get with a with a paycheck. You don't get it with a paycheck at a business where you know that you're working, you're working some hours, but ultimately you're enriching someone else. And you're not just enriching someone else, but you're also enriching someone else's community. Because most people, you know, if I, I'm, I'm from the Bronx, I'm from the South Bronx, and most of the businesses, uh, many businesses that are operating are not owned by the people who are actually living, who are actually working uh, certainly working within the business on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's not owned, they're not owned by people who live within the surrounding communities. And increasingly, more and more, the businesses that we're seeing in our, in our community are chain businesses. So they're national chains. And, so, and they're national chains that employ people at very low wages. And that's becoming more and more the norm. And so when you have that, what, what happens is that all profits generated by that business go to the owner, whoever the owners are. So if the owners live outside of you know, if they live several states over or several countries over or they're scattered all over the country in a public, publicly traded company, the people who actually live in that surrounding community who may be working at that, at that company don't actually get the profits that are generated by that community. So if you create a business that's actually owned by the people who work there, you're much more likely to see a, a true, true ripple effect of profits that are actually spread uh, further and further spread throughout the community and you have businesses that are a surrounding businesses that are able to grow and thrive because there's increased money moving through that community which actually is able to cycle for much longer periods of time and you have also the benefit of really creating opportunities for businesses that are really accountable to their community earlier I, I mentioned how you've got an accountability problem in the way the way companies are structured and the way our economy is structured, there's, a, there's an accountability problem. And that's rooted in the way companies are structured. So this is really about who's really making decisions, what's the level of ownership and what's involved in that. So if you've got businesses where you have owners who are not directly impacted by the operations of their business, then it means you've got companies that are engaged in practices that aren't, that are can be a counter, that are directly countering the interests and desires of the people who are in the surrounding community. And those, those aren't just the interests of people, but they're the interests of things that the people are also de depending on and relying on, which could be the quality of the water, the trees that are in that community, the, the surrounding, just the access to green and open spaces. So I come out of, prior to getting involved and, and really throwing myself head first into the world of cooperative development, I came out of the, the organizing world, the world of environmental justice organizing, fighting against environmental racism. And the fact that we have, and something that, that community groups on the ground have been saying for a long time, is that the crisis of global warming started in communities, it has started in communities, directly in communities that have been impacted, which have been primarily low-income communities and communities of color that are on the front lines of environmental pollution. So, and it's, it's in those places, in those communities, where you've got companies that have been running recklessly and engaging in practices that have directly been impacting and hurting the lives of people on the ground. Now, so as I said earlier, if you've got companies that are actually responsive to those communities, we wouldn't be talking about climate change as a problem. We wouldn't have a global climate crisis. We wouldn't be talking about melting polar ice caps. We would have companies that are actually responsive to the communities that they're in. We would have companies that are actually good neighbors, not because it's a nice idea, 
but because you just don't gas your neighbors. It's not a good thing to do. You don't want to be known as that, that woman or that man at the laundromat who gasses the rest of the community, or the person who fracked the water, or the person who, you know, uh, for whatever reason, is the reason why you know, all your, your water is, is toxic or your air is toxic, or any number of other things that are destroying the neighborhood is happening. So, so there's an account accountability crisis here, not just a global climate crisis, and it's something that is, really, that is really hurting us. So what we do at Green Worker Cooperatives is we create the opportunity for people to create different kinds of businesses. And, and that looks like we are, we're a training ground for people who come up with ideas and want to create a different kind of business. So we, we take people who come to us with any number of ideas and we run them through a cooperative business boot camp we call the Co-op Academy. And since we started this a few years ago, there are five other cities around the country where other organizations have taken this on and said that they want to, they want to engage in this and create these kinds of academies. And these are just some of the, some of the very happy uh, business owners and workers who've created businesses as a result. Uh, Ginger Moon provides, uh, provides food, food services for new mothers, catering to new mothers. We have uh, Caracol Interpreters Cooperative, which are interpreters and translators that will provide services for nonprofit organizations. We have a group called Tink that are their educators who said we can actually teach, teach young people how to do 3D printing and all the glamorous and wonderful things about you know, doing in, you know, new innovative ways of, of uh, small-scale manufacturing and engaging in technology in different ways. And we can do it together as workers, as owners who come together with ideas and actually create these things. So these are ways and these are businesses and they can be any kind of business in any kind of a space but they're operating in ways where it's people who are working together, who are making decisions, practicing democracy, and creating structures of accountability that are not just, don't just have an impact on their own lives directly, but they have an impact on the communities, the surrounding communities that they're a part of. So this is a different way of doing business, but it's a way that applies to all kinds of businesses in any kind of a sector. It's about ownership. And with that ownership comes accountability, and with that comes a responsibility and a new way, a different way of really uh, transforming our economy and creating democracy in every space on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. Thank you.